All right. Hello, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to this morning's event. How is nanotechnology affecting your wine, gut and climate? Uh, Corrales Riyad, a Concordia PhD candidate in the Individualized Program, Indy, and a public scholar here at Concordia University, is also the organizer and moderator for this event, and I'll pass it over to Caro in just a minute, and today's special guests will be introduced shortly. But first, a couple of words of for those of you unfamiliar with us, uh, with Force Space, Concordia University's Force Space is located in downtown Jajage, Montreal, on unceded Indigenous land. We are a university wide platform focused on working collaboratively with our community across the disciplines uh, to activate research projects, uh, pedagogy, and various initiatives via process based explorations. So I'll just note that we are currently recording this session and live streaming at CU4 Space on Facebook, and I'll pop those links in the chat in a minute. You're more than welcome to join in the conversation today uh, by sharing any thoughts and comments in the chat throughout. It's been activated for you. Um, and please use panelists and attendees as the option from the pull down menu, just so we can all see your comments. However, if you have burning questions for the panelists today after each of their presentations or during the Q&A period, we ask that you make Carol's life a little bit easier by popping those questions into the Q&A box proper so they can be addressed. Um, or if you prefer to speak, you're more than welcome to raise your virtual hand and we will sweep in and unmute you so that you can ask your question uh, live using audio. Okay, on that note, it's my pleasure to pass the floor over to the mastermind behind this event. Uh, Corollis, over to you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, good day, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar to talk about how nanotechnology affects our wine, gut, and climate. Three experts to join us today to help us learn, uh, Professor Sutiris Bertzinas from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Switzerland, commonly known as ETH, uh, Professor Alexander Taliki from Uppsala University in Sweden, and Professor Reza Holgi from Carleton University here in Canada. Professor Bertzinas is the world leading authority on the flame spray paralysis technology, commonly known as FSP, and we'll talk about gas sensing applications, which includes the diagnosis of diseases such as diabetes and measuring if your wine has the right alcohol percentage. He has graduated for his three PhDs and now at leading uh, positions in industry and academia worldwide, including our other two guests. I also had the privilege to spend nine months over two uh, visits at Professor Bertini's laboratory to learn about the synthesis of nanoparticles using the FSB technology, which he has pioneered. Professor Taliki researches pharmaceutical nanotechnology applications and will talk about flame made magnetic nanoparticles as your local guide in the gut after her PhD at ATH, where she receives the ATH Medal for Outstanding PhD. She joins the Formulation and Application R&D Department at DSM Nutritional Products in Basel, Switzerland. And then she was recruited at the SciLife Lab at and Uppsala University. Professor Holge will talk about how he uses the FSP as a screening tool for renewable jet fuels to mitigate harmful impacts on climate. He's a Canada Research Chair in Particle Technology and Combustion Engineering and directs the Energy and Particle Technology Laboratory at Carleton University. He was a research associate at ETH. His research focuses on novel energy storage technology and particulate emissions from combustion and their impact on climate change. Thank you all for joining us today. And I would like to welcome you to Concordia and Montreal, uh, albeit virtually. Uh, it was important for me to organize uh, today's webinar for a few reasons. Uh, the first is that recently Concordia acquired the first FSB reactor in Canada, and I'm eager to introduce it to the Concordia community as well as the broad Montreal community. The second reason are the specific applications that each of the guests will talk about, um, when, which span health, jet fuels, and climate. COVID has brought public health to the forefront of societal discourse, and uh, Montreal is the, largest air, is the third largest aerospace hub in the world. And during the last global climate strikes, the largest protest in history, Montreal has the largest turnout of any city anywhere else in the world. So I'm confident we'll have a very interesting discussion and I'm eager to learn alongside everyone in attendance today. Uh, after we hear from each of the guests, I'll moderate a Q&A period. Um, I invite everyone to send in their questions. And with that, I pass it on to Professor Bertinas. Thank you, Kero. I hope I'm coming across and I presume that I should share a screen now to the presentation. Actually, I'm really happy to join and uh, without having to travel. To me, this is the biggest benefit of this, um, I would say, unfortunate situation. But really, we have been able to at least stay home and do some good thinking. That's something we have to actually hope we can keep some of that 
when all of this is over, because we really learn a lot during this period. Hemi said, this let me share my screen and hopefully we'll do it um, right. And um, let's uh, hear the, see the, see that it's coming as they should be. Yes. So I hope you know that you see what I see. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, primarily we'll talk about the technology in which uh, it has been used for some time now. It's not actually uh, truly new, as they say, when something is new, it's not really new. People actually were making particles in flame for a long, long time. Actually, you can trace this back to the Chinese who were first made inks. The biggest product today is actually carbon black. It's a $17 billion business. And everyone tire, I, if one of you had a flat tire, and I'm sure this happened if you ever driven a car, you should know that at least 30% of that weight of the car is nanoparticles. As a matter of fact, FSP made nanoparticles, as I will show you right now. Sorry, and, I, I uh, hate to interrupt. Actually... We're not seeing your presentation yet. I'm sorry to interrupt. We're just seeing your yeah. desktop. I'm sorry. Not yet. Oh. We're seeing your desktop, not the slides. Not the slides. Uh oh. Let's try again. <laughs> That's, that's the beauty of working between two screens. It's okay, we'll get there. No all worries. right, all right. Uh, we will um, go back to the share screen. Let's see. Okay. Let's see that one now. Perfect. So it is there. Yep. Very good. So this is uh, the carbon black. You see a picture here of uh, the tires, which you know very well, and a, and a machine that makes, that is using inks for printing. And um, you can actually see the process here. It's the, the biggest process for making nanoparticles. And it's actually a spraying of a heavy oil into a flame. And this actually makes soot. And this process, actually, it is the FSP. It's actually how soot, how carbon black is made, as I just mentioned before. Other similar products in, the, in this business is titanium dioxide, another business of $9 billion worldwide. and. Uh, this is actually the whitest of the whites, as I say, for engineers in the audience, the Raylons number are in the orders of 1 million. And this is really a, a magnificent technology to deal with. And of course, another major product is fumed silica for optical fibers. If you have a headache, you actually take some silica nanoparticles because these are actually is what keeps these uh, pills together. Let's see if I can get, yes, also my laser pointer here. So this is actually what keeps the pills in one piece. Otherwise, when you open the vial, will be more dust than pills. So having said this, we can actually tell you that by now, we understand this technology in a, in a, we have a firm grip that is a, a multi-scale process. So typically, we teach our undergraduates on that scale, the so-called the continuum for the engineers. You may remember these magic words and with some trepidation. The navier stokes equations, they are really very intimidating. However, we know how to use them. We make code CFDs, and this is beautiful. And of course, for particles like in this stage we're talking about, this mesoscale is very important because this is telling you all of this structure, this filamentary, this fluffy structures. Nobody else, no other technology can make particles so fluffy as in the flames. This uh, suit is actually fascinating and very open, very light structures. Aerogels, for example, is a, an example. Another one, which is a, the next scale, of course, is the molecular dynamics. And we really understand, try to understand how truly everything happens. All of this, however, has one target, to make processes that can be actually made and scaled up. Because if you open, if you look at the cover pages of nature, of science, you see beautiful products, beautiful uh, ideas, but most of them, they die in the so-called the death valley of the scale up. When actually you can make all of these beautiful things in the lab, but if you cannot make them in mass, so our people can buy them and actually use them, hardly move away. So for me, when I got involved on this, I started with a process like that in flames where people heard, hardly understood and focusing on this, we actually discover, and the FSP is part of that. And it's very interesting that the laboratories were actually Care of maybe share, save us, show us a picture, actually have to operate at few millibars below atmospheric. Why? If something goes wrong, nothing goes out. 
of the door to go to the other people's offices. So it's important. Also, we have our people to wear the masks long before the COVID. And uh, actually, we, when actually started this in, the, in our um, town, we were the only ones to have this, uh, uh, what you call now, N95, these masks that they, because actually also they were zipping behind. We had to give them to the hospital. And of course, <laughs> later on, we could not get them back. The United States did not allow 3M to export them. So we had to improvise to be able to go where we are. And as we mentioned, we have to keep things, the students under pressure, but you need also to have some coffee. And in this case, you see some football to give some of the stress uh, coming out because you cannot have them under these conditions. But the most fascinating part, and this is what we're here to talk about, type and situations like this also drive innovation. This understanding is actually motivated us to make part, not just simple titanium dioxide or simple silicon dioxide, but far more complicated materials. Why? Because we had some great friend here. As you can see, Professor Biker, a great catalyst colleague, one of the leaders in the field who wanted all sorts of particles, the entire periodic table. So we couldn't do it with this technology that we did before, the silica, the titania. So and what you see here, a particle who looks like Mickey Mouse. OK, this is, a, this is platinum on alumina. Alumina is the face of Mickey. And the ears are the platinum clusters. And that way it was a, a very nice uh, catalyst for chiral. And as a matter of fact, it's a very good catalyst to filter gases before we put them to our sensors. Fantastic. This is now our latest. Uh, and we, can, we came back to this, which is a 20 years old paper, has been very effective for sensors. So what is, and this actually has created a lot of motive. And I will show you some products in the market already. And also major scientific organizations, in this case, the German National Science Foundation actually launched the program in 2017, a six year program for 20 PhD students across Germany to look at the fundamentals of FSP. On another front, the Harvard, the, the School of Public Health got a major grant from the National Institute of Health, 5 million, to essentially build a genome of the toxicity of nanomaterials. And what process did they pick to generate particles of different sizes, different characteristics, it was the FSP. Because sometimes when you make particles, depending on, the, on the how you make them, you develop different properties. And they wanted to have a standardized. And they picked up this process. And actually, the grant is running until this year and is moving, as I just heard yesterday, all of this to Rutgers University as of uh, in July. Now, what is FSP? Here, actually, you can see the real thing. You see the picture here to the left. And you can see actually what happens. You see one of these uh, the sprays coming out and the droplets quickly evaporate. This is, and then with these black dots, you see the particles collide, what we call coagulation and coalescence. And they grow. And if we want actually to put on top of them some uh, uh, platinum, as you just saw with the Mickey Mouse, so you can also, oops, sorry, we have to go back. So we can actually uh, allow this to be formed. And this is actually a fascinating process because it is the only one that not only can put these clusters on top of the particles, but as we found out, a unique way to put them inside the particles. And this is actually one of the latest things that we are pursuing right now because it gives you a new opportunity to make materials that, have, that cannot be done by wet chemistry. And uh, having said this, we can actually go to the even you can make hollow particles, if you can see here, if you do it right. But truly speaking, we don't use them very much. We were able to make some of those with Toyota, even 100 grams per hour. But the applications, they were not there to keep pursuing it. Having said this, we can actually now go to the next. Um, so, sorry. Hmm. Very good to see. What can you do with all of these particles? What are the products in the market? You can actually make beautiful science, beautiful papers as our students and the PhDs have done over the years. One of the biggest actually impact we made is this with nano silver. About 12 years ago, the EPA had been petitioned to have the nano silver to be labeled pesticide. And if one of the materials is getting that honor, you can never work with that again. You cannot really market it. 
And actually, we had a company that actually had been spun off from our labs a few years earlier, HiQ. And uh, the school actually came to me and asked me, wait a minute, we have uh, an issue here. Although I was not working at the time, or back again on silver, because since if we, we have, usually when we have a spin off, I don't work again because you like to give it this as a dowry, let's say, to the people who work with, you don't want to compete to go compete with your own students. And uh, nevertheless, this uh, had to go back and with Professor Sotiriu now in uh, Stockholm, he had made a very careful study where actually he saw that by making nano silver of different sizes, you were able to trace the toxicity, not to the particles, but to the ions. So if you could control the release of the ions from the particles, the particles, they were okay. Today, actually this company had a major impact with COVID by creating these uh, textiles that they have actually antibacterial properties. And uh, as we just talked earlier, in December 2020, this is uh, they got into the London Stock Exchange. That was the first company of Eteha Zurich to be in the London Stock Exchange. That they were valued for over 100 million uh, British pounds. And this actually works uh, quite well, and especially nowadays. Another major impact was uh, with uh, Professor Wendelin Stark, who actually built um, what they call metallic particles, but to be at a sizable production rate and make this, uh, as you see here, cobalt with a very thin film of carbon around it. And this actually they sell in the order of about, as you can see here, Sigma Aldrich. You can see the uh, if you go to your own lab on the catalog and actually have even the number here, you can see that this call about a hundred dollars, half a gram. So about 200,000 a kilo. And they tell me now the company Turbo Beats with uh, another great guy, Robert Grass, that they have managed even to sell even a kilo of those. Of course, a little bit cheaper than that, about $50,000 per kilo. But if you think this is now today, the price of gold. So that's what you can make in the FSP. So another now advantage is with Professor Herman, who, is, who takes these particles with another company, Hemotune. And this company actually puts the, you can put these particles inside the blood and they can remove various toxins or um, compounds that they have um, penetrated and is actually creating health issues. And this company is actually about to generate because in close collaboration with a medical school in Bern. Another company is Avantama who actually, if they go to the web page, they have the periodic table and you can actually pick up the material you want to make. And you can actually tell them, I want this at that size and tell me what is the estimate. And then they will tell you how many hundreds of dollars you have to pay for how many milligrams, okay? And this is a company now has 20 people is out there for about a dozen years. So it's another viable organization. By the way, the HiQ has 90 people working for them today. So the latest now fact, which I will talk a little bit more in the remaining minutes is this uh, gas sensors that you can see here. It is for actually monitoring lipolysis or the drinks as it is on the title of our uh, uh, webinar today about wine. And having said this, what is all about? The gas sensors is a major business today. If you look up the various reports, it's in the order of 2.3 billion per year. However, the impact of gas sensors is much more. They say in the United Kingdom, just the cost of the false alarms due to fires is in the order of 1 billion per year. So today we're looking for sensors for air quality indoors and outdoors. For food and agriculture, we like to know if the meat has been gone bad. People did expiration dates, especially with a signal of ammonia or if the fruit is ripened by looking into this uh, ethylene concentrations, having a sensors like that is quite important. And what we actually work quite a lot nowadays in my laboratories for health and lifestyle issues as I will elaborate in the remaining few minutes here. And how FSP works again? Of course, whenever we said in the beginning that we will do sensors by FSP, everybody told us we were out of your mind, why? Because all of these beautiful interdigitated networks that actually on top of them, the electrodes that you will deposit the particles, they will melt down by the heat of the flame. 
Nevertheless, the detail is on the very top, as you can see here, where is this cooling water, where actually by flowing water over it, you can remove the heat and these circuits can be intact. And essentially, you can actually put another flame and even improve the cohesion and the adhesion of the particles on the electrodes. And that's how actually it looks like. These are beautiful, very fluffy films. They have been what we call lace-like. And then by heating a little bit with this impinging flame, and you can see here, Professor Tricoli now in uh, who came up with that in uh, Australian National University, you can make these cauliflower-like structures and you can deposit one by one through so-called masks. And you can see here a, a, a wafer that has 69 of these sensors on top of it deposited that way. And you can see here this transparent film is a tin oxide film. I won't bother you with this specific, uh, but now the problem will come to the wine issue here that Caro mentioned in the beginning of his presentation. You may have heard, have seen the news that methanol is actually a major poison here for liquor in particular, because people tend to put this to either because of ignorance, what they know if you look here in standard distillation, the first uh, component that comes out during distillation of liquor is methanol. And people who know they should cut the, that pot and throw it away. Some people, they don't want to throw alcohol like that, but they would rather to add it to the real alcohol. And this creates the issue here that, and you can see here that uh, had actually 42 people in Iran three years ago or uh, 90 in India and uh, others in Philippines, even we had uh, uh, in Mexico, uh, earlier this, uh, in, uh, in about 90 people, about 45 in Turkey, especially in connection to these um, antiseptics that people, because they have also alcohol, people tend to consume. And some of them, they are also contain methanol. And this is the issue. And we got involved into that. And essentially, we combine the sensor with a separation column. What you see here with uh, my latest PhD graduate, Dr. Van der Broek, who actually combined, this is now the sensor that you just saw, this tiny little square that you see to the bottom of my screen. Here is the sensor. And these are, you know, palladium doped tin oxide. And you can see here the filamentary structures. And if you proceed this with a chromatographic column, just had that, that's, well, let me call it like that. It's actually a polymer beads that they absorb compounds. And then after they absorb, they release them. And during that, you, the difference that you see in the release, the so-called uh, retention time, we can distinguish methanol from ethanol and much higher concentrations. And this is now a graph of that. This is the sensor. This is now how they come out of the column. And very first comes methanol here, about 1%. And even if I put water, this is the single peak that you see here. If I have a beer and we add it to the beer, you can see this is the alcohol peak that comes at about five minutes. If it is Arak, 40% more, like whiskey, this is typical in Indonesia, or straw rum, 80% in ethanol. You can see it here. You can beautifully distinguish the two peaks. And you can see here all of these drinks. And this is a Keros wine with the brown uh, triangles. You know, pure is the what you see here, quite low in terms of ethanol concentration. And with a wine here, if we spike them, will be here much more. And of course, this is where you create problems. And we went, of course, to see, because all of this is done at the head space above the drink. So you take a sample of that with this little probe, as you saw, and you can actually send it. And you can see that this works for an hour nonstop. You can distinguish, again, here, the small peak is the methanol. This is the ethanol here. And also, for about over three months, this worked very well. And this is actually, and here you can see all the drinks and the from uh, Chile to the United States, Australia, Korea, you name it, all different drinks all over the world, they were able actually to follow on top of the line. You can see here the sensor concentration and the actual concentration and beautiful one-to-one -one line to actually motivate the people to file the patents and eventually the company we just discussed earlier in this presentation. Having said this, this is how the beauty looks like. And you can see now uh, the sample of the drink here on top of that is the little probe that pulls the vapor. And this will go through the separation column you see here on the hand. And this is the actual sensor, the white box. And here are the electronics. And all of this is connected 
to the iPhone, and you can beautifully see the concentration of methanol and the ethanol. So if you take, take a drink and tells you 40% is alcohol, let's say whiskey, immediately you can calibrate to see if the sensor works well, if it picked up whatever the manufacturer said for the ethanol. And at the same time, you see if your drink is contaminated. Of course, this is important now also for people who have been intoxicated. And I hope with this, I gave you a flavor for this 10, 15 minutes to, because professors are programmed to speak for 45. So I hope I was able to confine myself to the time allotted by the organizers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Bertini. This is very, very interesting. I can attest that I have lost every single foosball game that I've ever played at PTL. Um, so um, next is Professor uh, Taliki. Um, I think maybe Professor Bertini. Yes, there you go. Um, Professor Taliki, all uh, I pass it to you. I think you're muted as well. I'm working on it. <laughs> there you go. Share my screen. Is it okay? Do you see what you should see? Thumbs yes, up. Perfect. Great. <laughs> so thank you very much for inviting me and giving this opportunity to um, give you a bit of insight on the nanomedical uses uh, of flame-made nanoparticles. Um, before I start, I just wanted to uh, uh, give you an insight in Uppsala University, maybe uh, not that well known in, in Canada. So we're actually the oldest university in Sweden, found, founded in 1477. Uh, quite a large uh, university with over 50,000 students. And I just wanted to give you a flavor of some of our uh, famous alumni. So we have, for example, Carl von Linnaeus that you can see here, who is the founder of the classification of our uh, plant and animal system as we, as we know it today. Uh, then we have Anders Celsius, who at least for those of us who don't use Fahrenheit is a very commonly used scientific measure of temperature. Uh, and then more recently, for example, Niklas Sandström, who is a founder of Skype, who is, I think, uh, had a good business this past year as we have been growing more and more <laughs> digital and communicating in in new ways but with also advantages that we can have such webinars as we have today as you also said um so i'm also affiliated to something called science for life laboratory which i would uh, really like to highlight because it this is a national infrastructure in molecular biosciences uh, and this has actually been quite crucial in framing the research that we are doing because uh, I'm, a, I'm a materials engineer by training or a chemical engineer uh, but we are now as I will show you briefly today developing nanomaterials for biomedical applications and in order to do that successfully you need to very closely collaborate with with the clinics and actually identify the medical needs in the clinics and that's why such a network is really very very crucial. So this is a, a national infrastructure that was founded 10 years ago by the Swedish government. Uh, and it has its node in the Stockholm Uppsala region. So Uppsala is just north of, of Stockholm, um, actually very close to the Arlanda airport for those of you who hopefully can travel to Sweden soon again. Uh, so it's uniting uh, four universities uh, in this area. Uh, and it has focused both on, uh, on establishing new research group, but also a lot of uh, national infrastructures, uh, for example, in, uh, in biobanking, characterization of protein, biomarkers, and so on. So crucial infrastructures that are supporting the research that we are carrying out in our, in our lab. So nanomaterials, you already got a, got a flavor uh, about what it's, what it's about. And, uh, I, I'm actually surprised the uh, Professor Patsinis didn't highlight that uh, nano comes from, from the word Greek, um, uh, from the Greek word meaning dwarf. So just a picture here of some famous uh, dwarfs from uh, recent or less he recent history. Um, the reason I wanted to just give you uh, or highlight 
at what scale we are, especially if we are thinking of these biomedical applications. So you can see here these length scales and you can see some structures here. So antibodies, viruses, bacteria, cancer cells, so roughly their sizes are indicated here. And what we refer to as nanomaterials or the world of, of nanotechnology is in this area of one to 100 nanometers. So why is this now interesting? Because if you compare now to the size of a bacteria, for example, we can see that our bacteria, our, our materials is even at a smaller length scale. So both comparing to bacteria or different types of cells. And this gives us actually unique opportunities in a biomedical sense uh, that our materials uh, can, because of their small size, can directly uh, interact uh, with uh, biological entities such as bacteria and cancer cells uh, or even viruses. Um, so looking a bit before, uh, before I will highlight uh, some of the applications we've looked into uh, when it comes to flame-made nanoparticles in, in nanomedicine, I wanted to give you just a brief overview of where nanomedicine as, at, at large uh, stands. Um, so mo most of the research around nanomedicine has actually uh, focused on finding treatments for cancer, so uh, different drug delivery systems, for example, to treat uh, uh, tumors in different parts uh, of the body. And you can see here the uh, historical timeline of nanomedicine and how they have uh, how they have evolved. Um, and actually, nanomedicine, of course, is a broad sense, so it doesn't only concern uh, nanoparticles like. Uh, um, the one of metal oxides, for example, that we are making in the flame reactors, but they actually started out with these more uh, so-called liposome structures. Uh, so these are basically lipid bilayers, um, and they, of course, resemble the structure of the cell membranes, and by that they can then also uh, interact with, with cell membranes. So they were actually the, the pioneers in the nanomedical field. And the first marketed drug, uh, Doxil, so this is also a cancer treatment, is based on such a liposomal drug delivery system. And then, of course, this has evolved, and over the years, more and more different types of nanomedical applications have, have reached uh, the markets. And you can see the the evolution here. And I will highlight a few of them later on, for example, these iron oxide uh, nanoparticles specifically that, uh, that can be used both as a, as a contrast agent, as an imaging agent, uh, but also for treatment of, of cancer cells. So breaking down this timeline a bit into numbers, so you get, in, you get a feeling of what is, what is out there. Um, so these numbers are uh, quite recent, about two, two years old. Um, so we have a rough uh, about 25 to 30 FDA or EMA approved nanomedicines on the market today. And there are about uh, close to 50 nanoparticle technologies in ongoing, ongoing clinical trials. Um, there are different applications. So I mentioned the, the cancer treatment. So of course, this is about delivering drugs to a certain, uh, to a certain uh, part of the body. You might also have heard about targeted uh, treatments, for example, of, of cancer, where you want uh, your cancer drug to go specifically to cancer cells and not affecting the rest, uh, rest of the body. However, actually nano, nanoparticles find or has also two other very important application areas, and that is diagnosis. So to use them um, similarly to what we saw in, in Professor Pazzini's uh, talk with, with the sensors, so to use them for different diagnostic purposes uh, to diagnose disease. And then uh, for imaging purposes, so this can also be linked then to the diagnosis, so simply to get a, an image of the diseased area. Um, so what has, as I mentioned, I think the most, a large major, majority still of the nanoparticles in these clinical trials are based on different type of lipid, lipid systems. So these are yeah, a mixture of lipids or, or surfactants uh, that are forming these kind of structures that I've, I've uh, showed you on the previous slide. Um, then we have uh, some materials that can be used for contrast agents, uh, the iron oxides that we are particularly interested in. And we have also some developments, for example, of nanoparticles for vaccines or fungal treatments. And of course, you cannot talk about nanomedicine these days without at least briefly touching upon the current uh, pandemic. 
Uh, and some of you might uh, might be aware of the of the vaccinations that came out with uh, from Moderna and BioNTech, for example, that are actually based on such a lipid based nanoparticle system where these lipid structures are carrying these um, mRNA vaccines. However, this is not the only application actually of nanoparticles uh, in this uh, fight of this pandemic. Uh, as Professor Pratzin has highlighted, these uh, nanomaterials can actually be used as coating on the personal protective equipment uh, to serve as a kind of antiviral um, coating surface. Uh, what There's also a lot of work uh, in the development of uh, pulmonary drug delivery systems. So these are meant uh, for inhalation uh, of drugs where the nanomaterials can serve as carriers uh, of drug particles. Uh, to be delivered for a local treatment uh, in the lungs. Um, so before we go, so kind of linking maybe why we are uh, focusing on the flame synthesis of our nanomaterials. So, I mean, all these nanomedical applications are really promising and we see a lot of them now reaching the clinics uh, and the numbers I showed you might are quite impressive. However, you also have to relate them to the, to the research that has been carried out for maybe the past uh, two, three decades in this area. So if you look instead now at the number of uh, publications, so this is just from PubMed. So this is a, a search engine for more medically oriented uh, research articles. And you just type in simply the word nanoparticle to see, to see what's going on. I mean, what you can see, of course, that it's still on the rise. It's a very hot research area. And there are today roughly 30,000 articles uh, published every year on the area of nanoparticle with some kind of medical application. So if you have that number in, in mind, then actually 25 to 30 approved nanomedical drugs might seem very little. So you might wonder what is happening, where, where is the rest? Um, and this is also what Pratinis was highlighting uh, that in many of these cases, you have uh, people are developing fantastic applications of nanomaterials. However, their synthesis methods are not scalable. And this is very problematic when it comes to translation of these nanomedical materials to the clinics. Because as you are going through a, a drug development process, uh, going from the laboratory scale, you pretty fast have to move into different type of in vitro, in vivo evaluations, and finally going into human trials. And as you are moving through this drug development process, of course, your demand for larger quantities of materials is rapidly increasing. And many, many uh, processes for nanoparticle synthesis are not able to live up to this demand of producing larger quantities of nanomaterials and also producing them, uh, producing them in a reproducible fashion. So meaning that each batch of nanomaterial should always have the same properties. Otherwise, you will not have the same efficacy, for example, when you administer it to the patients. And this was actually also a problem when we look specifically at iron oxide used as a contrast agent in the clinics. So this was actually a, a, an approved material that was used as an MRI contrast agent, but it was actually discontinued from the clinics because they had very uh, large variations batch to batch. So the material was not always performing the, sa uh, the same way. And that, of course, leads to the fact that the clinicians cannot diagnose or use the material in a reproducible way. Um, so that is why um, so I was uh, educated around this technique in Professor Pazzini's lab at ETH during my PhD studies. And we are, I mean, I'm still today so impressed and real by the capacity of this process, uh, both in what type of materials it can produce, but also this that it's scalable in and also in a reproducible way. And you might recognize this picture that also Professor Pratzinis had in this uh, in his presentation. So this is actually me uh, running the pilot scale reactor at ETH Zurich during my uh, PhD uh, days. Um, so focusing now a bit on magnetic nanoparticles, which is our primary interest in our, in our lab today. Um, so these, um, these materials, so for example, iron oxides, um, they actually have a quite uh, interesting and uh, vast different applications when it comes to biomedical research. So first of all, I touched upon this already. They can be used as contrast agents in molecular um, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. Uh, they can be also used for something called hyperthermia. 
so this is a property of these uh, nanoparticles that when you put them in a magnetic field, they start generating heat. And this is actually uh, already today used in the clinics uh, by a German company called Magforce, uh, where they have launched these type of magnetic nanoparticles for the treatment of brain tumors. So you can see here a CT scan where the brain tumor is uh, this red area located there. So they um, localize these magnetic nanoparticles there, and then the patient is placed in this magnetic field. The particles generate heat, and by that, uh, the cancer cells uh, are dying, or at least weakened and become more susceptible afterwards for a, for a more traditional um, chemotherapeutic treatment. And finally, these materials can also be used as drug delivery systems. So this basically means that you are using the nanomaterial as a carrier uh, of different uh, drug molecules to get them to the right area in the body. Um, so uh, our process uh, looks like this. We use a, a, a slightly modified uh, flame reactor where we are producing the iron oxide nanoparticles, as you have seen before. Uh, but we have a second compartment where we also uh, introduce a very nano, a thin, nanothin coating of silicon dioxide encapsulating these magnetic iron oxide nanoparticles. So you can see that here in this electron microscope image, uh, the very thin silica layer which is surrounding these iron oxide uh, nanoparticles. And this is very important because uh, with the help of the silica layer, uh, we can actually very easily disperse uh, these nanoparticles in biologically relevant media. So you can put them in a, in a biologically relevant liquid and they disperse nicely and you can then use them in your, in your further trials. Um, these materials, so the process gives us very fine control over particle size, so we can tune uh, tune the size and of course the size will then affect the performance uh, of these nanoparticles. Uh, we have very, very good high batch to batch reproducibility. So you can see here the crystallinity of this material and basically just showing that every batch that we produce always has the same properties. Um, because we are at this nanoscale, so below 30 nanometers, these materials uh, behave as super paramagnets. So this is something that's different from iron oxide when you have it in a, in a larger size in the bulk. Uh, and what you can see here, so we have here a highly concentrated uh, aqueous liquid with the nanoparticles inside. And what you can do is when you place the ma a magnet below this liquid, you can localize the nanoparticles at that area. So this is something you can also then do in the body. If you want to localize the nanoparticles at a certain area of the disease, you can do that with the aid of a magnet. Um, I briefly mentioned this hyperthermia, uh, so meaning that the particles generate uh, heat in the presence of an alternating magnetic field. And this is already used uh, to treat uh, tumors, for example. So you can see here just a, a graph of this here on the bottom left. Uh, so we have made here a bit larger structures, so so-called microcapsules with the nanoparticles incorporated. And you can see here where it says AMF on, this is where we turn on the magnetic field. And we start at 37 degrees, so the uh, temperature of our body, and we can see how we increase the temperature up to about 42 degrees. And then as soon as we turn off uh, this magnetic field, you see that the temperature goes back to the, to the normal. Um, and this is something that you can exploit, so not only to, to kill cells, uh, but you can also, if you imagine such structures, so this is again the liposomes that I was talking about earlier, where you have these lipid uh, bilayers and you could have in the center then, for example, the mRNA drug for the, for the COVID vaccines or other type of drugs. And you can then place these nanoparticles in the shell of this liposome. And then when you turn on this magnetic uh, field, uh, you kind of break or melt the shell. And by that, you then release the cargo that is inside uh, these type of liposomes. So it's a kind of a, of a triggered drug delivery system. So just my, my last two slides to show you some of the ongoing projects in this area that we are working on. So uh, PhD student Shakib Ansari at Uppsala University have, um, ha is exploring a, a kind of new application of these magnetic nanoparticles uh, where we use the, the magnetic nanoparticles and this hyperthermia, so this ability to generate heat. Uh, we are using them directly in, in tablets. So these are small pills 
uh, that are a mixture of a drug, um, a model drug, the magnetic nanoparticles and the polymer that is acting as kind of the continuous phase. Now we place this whole uh, structure. So this tablet, you can see here the, uh, just an IR image of our tablets in the ma magnetic field. And by the presence of the nanoparticles, we then heat up the whole tablet. So you can see in a very short amount of time, we can go from room temperature up to about 160 degrees Celsius. And by that, we create something called an amorphous solid dispersion. So basically, the, um, the, the drug um, that is crystalline, so it has a very rigid uh, ordered structure before, is broken up and dispersed in this polymer in something we call an amorphous structure. Um, so why is this important? Um, this is important for some drugs that have, very have a large difficulty to, to dissolve. Uh, and this is, of course, important because when you take a drug orally, it goes into your gastrointestinal tract, which is full of, of water primarily. And there it first has to dissolve. So it has to break up into individual molecules that can then be absorbed by the body. And for some molecules, this is very, uh, is very difficult. They are very poorly water soluble. Uh, so making them amorphous, breaking up this crystal structure is one strategy to improve the dissolution rate of such uh, type of, of drugs. And in the end for the patient, this will result in an increased oral bioavailability of these, of these drugs that are taken uh, orally. Um, another thing that we are looking into now is to use these nanoparticles as diagnostic tools uh, for diseases in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and one disease that we are particularly focusing on right now is inflammatory bowel disease. So this is a chronic inflammation of the gastrointestinal tracts that it, it affects millions of people worldwide and is actually also on the rise. Um, and what is very alarming is that actually 25% of uh, IBD patients are currently now uh, children, so around 10 to 12 years old. And it's also incurable. So once you are afflicted with this disease, you are unfortunately stuck with it your whole, uh, your whole life. So there are several medical challenges associated with this disease. And I will just, in the interest of time, focus on the, on the diagnosis. So the diagnosis today is done with so-called endoscopy. So when the clinician is going in with a small camera into your gastrointestinal tract to see where, in, uh, where is the inflammation located. And this, of course, is very unpleasant for the patient. And also in, the, in case of children, it has to be done under anesthesia. So it's even more complicated in the clinical setting. Um, so what we are trying to or want to develop now is to use our nanoparticles uh, as uh, diagnostic tools. So to be able to image non-invasively this inflammatory condition of the gastrointestinal tract without having to do this endoscopic examination. So we were recently funded uh, an EU project for this, uh, which is actually a major uh, collaboration with several bringing together different disciplines uh, in the field in order to tackle this problem. So also connecting back to where I started that we are in an environment here at SciLife Lab, which brings us very close to a different medical experts and also clinicians uh, to be able to work on such, on such a large project. Um, so for this, we are working with, uh, with gastroenterologists in order to identify uh, these disease states. Uh, so we are looking for specific proteins which are characteristic for inflammation in the gastrointestinal tracts. We are then, of course, using the flame spray synthesis to engineer our nanoparticles. Uh, and then we are using them uh, as these non-invasive diagnostic tools uh, based on, for example, MRI that is widely available in the clinics. And we also aim to go the full way. So based on the diagnosis, then also design drug delivery systems with these triggered release that I was describing to you earlier, and hopefully take it the last step to even 3D print personalized drugs that can be then given to these, especially these pediatric IBD patients. Um, so this is the, at the core of this is project is, are these iron oxide nanoparticles that are silica coated that we made with the flame spray uh, reactor. And we functionalize them with antibodies that are then, um, yeah, kind of 
uh, like little sensors that are specific to biomarkers that are overexpressed in the inflamed tissue in these patients. So the idea is that these nanoparticles will then go to the inflamed areas in the gastrointestinal tract, and this can then be imaged by different magnetic imaging techniques. So MRI I already talked about, this is already today used in the clinics. Uh, but we are also looking into a new imaging technique called magnetic particle imaging. Um, and you can maybe just look at uh, to see to understand the difference between these imaging techniques. Uh, in MRI, you get these kind of images in gray. So it actually, uh, you have a lot of signal from the surrounding tissue, and it actually requires uh, very highly skilled clinical personnel in order to interpret these kind of uh, MRI images. Uh, in MPI, actually, you just image the iron oxide nanoparticles themselves. So as you can see here on this mouse, the red spots, that's the only signal you get. So you really just image the nanoparticle itself. So it's, it's of course, much easier to interpret these type of images. And what's also very unique is that the intensity of this, uh, of this signal here is linear. So it's actually proportional, uh, linearly proportional to the amount of nanoparticles that are located at that spot. So that also gives us a new tool uh, to be able to quantify. So the clinician can not only know where is the inflammation, but he or she can then also quantify how active is it. So do we have a very strong inflammation going on or is it actually receding and healing? So it will be hopefully a new way to get also more information about the disease state uh, in these patients. So with that, I will uh, finish off here. I hope I showed you a flavor of how uh, flame-made magnetic nanoparticles uh, can be used for uh, different medical applications. And I want to just thank especially my, my team members at Uppsala University who are doing uh, the work around, around this. And thank you to the to the organizers again for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Professor Taliki. Uh, I was excited to see a 3D printer in one of the slides because it's part <laughs> of my research as well. Um, next is Professor Holby. Um, uh, uh, yes, I'll just let me share my screen. Perfect. Can you see that well? Yes. Okay, uh, thanks again for, for inviting me and, and giving me the opportunity to, to talk today. So uh, I joined Carleton University, which you can see it's beautiful campus when it's not covered in uh, snow, hopefully in a few months. Uh, we are in, uh, Carleton is uh, located in Ottawa. So it's a relatively small university uh, and it's um, uh, together with the University of Ottawa are the two institutions that we have in, uh, in uh, this city. But one of the biggest advantage of us is that we are close to many national labs that are in, in Ottawa, and that makes it easy to make uh, dreams reality in terms of research. So what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit different to what Professor Pretzinius and Professor Tulecki presented, and that's, uh, about soot nanoparticles. So soot particles are, are generated uh, or emission of soot particles is basically a sign of incomplete combustion. And every year about eight megatons of soot particles are released into the atmosphere. Now, if you look at this map uh, around the globe, um, the primary source of soot emissions are different. In Europe, uh, the main source of emission is, is uh, diesel engines. In North America, uh, most of the emissions is coming from aviation as well as um, shipping. Uh, of course, there are a lot of soot particles that are emitted into the atmosphere from forest fires. Uh, recently, the, uh, we see uh, more frequently forest fires in, in the Amazon or in um, Australia. And that's uh, something that will happen more frequently due to climate change. And those emit huge amount of soot particles into the atmosphere. And uh, of course, in certain part of the world, mainly in India and China, biomass burning is the main source of soot particles. Now, soot is the, the third contributor to global warming, but its uh, uh, impact on global warming is not well understood. 
And part of that reason is uh, when people look at soot particle, they just think of it as a dirty black particle that we want to get rid of. But if you look at the character of soot particles from all these different sources, you'll see that there are significant differences between them. And that impacts how they interact uh, with our climate and their global warming impact. And that's what I learned when I joined Professor Petsini's lab a couple of years ago, that uh, when we start to look at these particles and uh, assume that each of them have a character, then we can make progress and, and, uh, be, uh, and uh, try to distinguish different impacts that they can make on our climate. So what I want to focus today is particulate matter soot emissions from aviation. If you look at emissions from jet engines 60 years ago, this is sort of what you would expect when an aircraft was, was uh, uh, you know, taking off. And, and in fact, that was a big problem. So that, prompt, that uh, resulted in uh, introduction of um, emission reg regulations to mitigate these smoke emissions. And industry has made a huge progress. Now, looking at new engines, we barely can uh, detect any black smoke coming out of them. And in fact, this is an image uh, that I got from one of our collaborators, Dr. Lobo from NRC in, in Ottawa, that shows uh, the emissions, soot emissions collected on filters for en aircraft engines from different generations. And as you can see, new engines, for new engines, we cannot detect anything. It's very difficult to see any soot emissions. But the fact that we don't see them doesn't mean that they're not there. So these, oops, these modern engines, they don't produce tons of soot particles, but they produce a lot of small particles that are difficult to see. And in fact, those small particles are even more dangerous for our health because our respiratory tract, they cannot be trapped in our respiratory system and can penetrate deep into our lung. And that's where the problem comes from. So the industry has made great progress to reduce the mass of these particles, but now engines produce a lot of small particles, which we can't see and are more dangerous for our health. So that's why uh, we really wanted to understand uh, how these particles are formed and characterize them. Now, if you look at one of the soot particles, as Professor Pratsini has mentioned, these particles have, are very fluffy. They have a porous structure. And the particles that are emitted from jet engines have three uh, distinct characters that we want to make, that we want to understand. One of them is size. So when we start to look at the size of these particles, there are two uh, parameters that we need to uh, understand. One is the so-called their mobility diameter, which is the, the size parameter which uh, tells us how these particles will transport into the atmosphere, how they can penetrate into our lungs. But there is another characteristic size, and that's the size of each of these small spheres in the cluster. And we call that primary particle uh, size or diameter. And that indeed uh, um, determines the surface area of these particles. And many of the health issues or toxicity of these particles is governed by the surface area and primary particle diameter. And jet engine particles have very small mobility diameter. So that results in for these particles to stay in the atmosphere for a long time and contribute to, to global warming. And they also have very small primary particle diameter. So that's what makes them particularly um, dangerous from health point of view. Another parameter that is important when we look at these particles is the composition of the particles. So generally, as the particles are produced in higher hot temperature regions, they become more black or graphitic. And that results in uh, more light absorption and more warming effect, so to speak, uh, for these particles. Now, the type of particles that are emitted from aircrafts at high altitude or generally thrust generating conditions is very high in elemental carbon. So composition is usually characterized by the so-called EC to TC ratio and engine particles 
have very high EC to TC ratios, more than 80%. And another important property of these particles is their optical properties, which is usually characterized by the so-called MAC or mass absorption cross-section. And that's a measure of how much light is absorbed per unit mass of particles. Remember, each year we are emitting eight teratons of particles into the atmospheres, eight megatons, sorry, of particles into the atmosphere. And each gram of these particles absorbs light equivalent to a square of 7.5 meters. Now you can do the mass and that gives you a sense of how important these soot particles or how strong of a driving force these particles are in global warming. So these are the three characteristics of uh, jet engine particles, uh, which um, we wanted to study. But performing engine tests and performing measuring emissions from engines is extremely difficult and expensive. Uh, usually these tests are done in, in, uh, in test cells. Here is a test cell in, in Zurich airport and um, it's expensive. It needs months of planning. And even when you do that, you will burn uh, hundreds of liters of fuel, which uh, is very, uh, uh, very difficult to, to, to manage. Sometimes, you know, uh, probes are brought into the airports. Now, this is the uh, image from a measurement campaign that I got from our uh, collaborator, Dr. Lobo, here in NRC Canada. And performing tests in open environment has its own challenges. If winds blows, if humidity is not what you want, it's very difficult. In fact, we've been trying for months now to secure some test time uh, with um, Spanish uh, Aerospace Research Center. And um, uh, when, when one can secure such a time, everybody wants to do measurements. So it's very precious and very difficult to have uh, access to these facilities. So that's why people usually use soot generators. There are different type of soot generators, which are, you know, bench top, you could carry them around, put them on your, in your lab and make particles. This is actually one of the first soot generators which is made in Switzerland. And um, it uses a kind of a candle flame uh, and blows off to, to make uh, particles. This is another type that was made in Canada. And again, this is a laminar flame which produces particles. And this is a picture that I got when I was in, in uh, Professor Pretzini's lab from a premix flame. The yellow color, the beautiful yellow color that you see is because of the soot particles heated and emitting light. But using the question is, can we really approximate this beautiful engineering marvel with a small soot generator? Do we expect to get similar particles from these small soot generators with similar characters as those of engines? To me, it's like comparing a forest fire and trying to convince me that this forest fire is similar to a candle fire. Well, of course, both of them are fires, but uh, both of them are flames, have flames, but the particles and their characters are very different. And in fact, when we look at the composition, remember the elemental to total carbon ratio, and here you can see that as a function of size of these particles, and this is the range of uh, thrust producing conditions, the composition of uh, particles for uh, thrust producing conditions. And you see very high elemental to total carbon ratio with small sizes. So that's where we need to make particles. And none of these soot generators, as you can see here, can make particles in the target region of composition and size that we were interested in. So that's what made me interested in in using FSP to make soot particles. So FSP is usually used to make inorganic particles. The uh, type of particles that Professor Pizzinis and Professor Teleki talked about, usually there, we don't want to make carbon. Uh, soot is unwanted there. And in fact, it's very difficult to make soot particles with this. So what we tried to do was that we said, can we make soot particles by uh, FSP using liquid fuels? And if we can, then that's a big advantage because FSP is designed to control and give unique properties for soot particles. So with that, we could control the properties of particles. And that's what I did uh, during my last uh, months is when I was in uh, 
in, in uh, Professor Petzini's lab with my uh, master's student, uh, Valentina then. So we just injected liquid fuel and tried to sample uh, particles uh, and sent them through an array of characteristic uh, instruments uh, to see how these particles look like. In fact, uh, back then, one day, Professor Pritzin has come to me and said, what do you need for your dream project? And said, well, it would be nice to have one of these equipment. And he said, think bigger. And I said, okay, let's, it's good to have two of them. And he said, think even bigger. And then I said, okay, now if that's the case, I want all of them. And this is how the setup looked like uh, back in, in, in ETA. So we characterized the particles and we characterized optical properties of these uh, particles to see whether FSP made soot is similar to jet engine like soot particles. So this is how the flames look like. We just put things on fire and we try to understand, you know, what kind of um, envelope we can cover with, uh, with this uh, device. So here you can see uh, how the flame changed by increasing the liquid fuel from a few milliliter, uh, from nine to 12 milliliter. We could even uh, change, make it even longer by changing the oxygen that is used to atomize this. And so this gives us very good control uh, over parameters. And now we are dealing with a flame that is uh, turbulent, very similar to the kind of flames that are in, in engines. So with that, remember, we wanted to control the size of the particles. And this is how we could very well uh, cover the whole range of sizes that are made from, uh, from aircraft engines. Here you're looking at this big diameter, remember the mobility diameter of these particles. And by just changing the liquid flow rate, we could change mobility diameter from very small, 21 nanometer to very large, 91 nanometer. Another parameter was this primary particle size, the size of each of these small spheres, which dictates the surface area and the toxicity of these particles. And the FSP made particles shown with diamonds have very similar primary particle sizes and distributions as those emitted from jet engines. So in terms of morphology, FSP, with FSP, we could make particles with similar properties as those emitted from, from engine, which was very promising. But the main challenge and the main question was, do they have the same composition? Because uh, composition dictates how they absorb light and that's important to, uh, to know. And just as a reminder, we wanted to make particles within, this was our target regime, very small particles, small in mobile diameter, but rich in, in composition. And none of the suit generators can make particles in that region. But with FSP, all conditions, with all conditions, we could make very small particles, yet very rich in terms of elemental carbon and light absorbing. So they have the same morphology, the same composition. Do they have the same optical properties? And that's where the dream came through and we could characterize these particles with uh, all of those equipment. So here you're looking at mass absorption cross-section or how much um, light these particles absorb per unit mass. And uh, this is what we measured. So uh, the, we measured that for soot particles with different uh, agglomerate mass with two different instruments and compared that with soot generated uh, with high elemental carbon. And as you can see, it agrees well and we could make particles within the target region that we were interested in. So I hope uh, I could um, convince you and trigger some interest uh, for this technology. And I hope I could convince you that with FSP, we could also make organic nanoparticles. And uh, this tool gives us very good control over its morphology, composition, and we could use it as, um, as a realistic um, surrogate uh, for any equipment that burns liquid fuels. Now, aircraft is one, uh, jet engines is one example. Marine engines is another example. And uh, for these tests, we only need a few milligrams of milliliters of uh, fuel compared to hundreds of liters of fuel. So it's a very 
uh, useful tool when it comes to screening and developing new fuels and new renewable fuels. And that's what we are uh, working with our collaborators here in Ottawa to uh, push forward. So uh, thanks again for your attention and uh, floor is yours, Karis. Thank you very much, Professor Holge. I think we already have some questions. Uh, I also have quite a few, but I think I, I'll prioritize uh, the ones coming from the audience. Um, so there's a question from Farzad who is talking about um, what kind of work is being done to align nanoparticles and tackle agglomeration. He was, he's talking specifically about using magnetic fields or, uh, or electric fields uh, that can help align nanoparticles. Uh, he hasn't mentioned who he's directing this to, so I, I don't know who might want to answer that. Maybe so I should go since I talked about magnetic nanoparticles. Um, yes, I, I am aware of that, that work that has been done in, in, other, in other synthesis techniques primarily where they are yeah, nicely lining up, for example, magnetic nanoparticles in, in like a thread type uh, structure using, using magnetic fields. Uh, that, that's not something we have done. I guess our, um, our answer to tackle uh, um, agglomeration and dispersion of, of nanoparticles has been the silica coating. Uh, so we actually did... Um, it did quite a rigorous magnetic characterization back at ETH of these magnetic nanoparticles, uh, collaborating actually with geophysicists uh, at another department of earth sciences at ETH Zurich, who are of course experts in, in, in characterizing magnetic nanoparticles. Uh, and there we were able to see, so actually by having this nanothin silica layer that is only two nanometers th uh, thin, we are actually um, separating the magnetic cores. Uh, and this is actually essential in order to preserve these so-called super paramagnetic properties. So they are actually uh, enhanced by this uh, silica coating because otherwise, I mean, you have magnetic nanoparticles, they are like little magnets. So you put them in a, in a liquid and they go together. So even if they are nano-sized, they will aggregate or agglomerate into larger structures and then actually by that lose some of these properties that are unique to their small size. So yeah, I, I, I guess our answer is that, that our way to, to kind of circumvent this and, and uh, facilitate their use has been this nano-thin silica coating. Thank you, Professor. Um, Professor Bertinis, I, I was curious about the slide on, on uh, expiry dates. And, and I'm, I'm also very interested in food waste and waste in general. And I know one of the reasons for so much food waste is that expiry dates are, are sort of arbitrary, so they're not based on, on health or science. And I'm wondering if you see this technology being used to address that. Uh, you're muted. Yes, you know, primarily what comes out um, when the so-called uh, rotting of the or even maturing or ripening, like in the case of bananas, you know, ethylene. So this is the key part, how they can artificially ripen them. In the case of food getting bad, it usually traced to ammonia, okay? And by being able to sense the ammonia concentrations and that's low, you can sense it, then the earliest you can catch it. Because of course, as if you do nothing, and we have developed some sensors and some of the colleagues here they have, um, or I think we have a couple of papers on that, how th there are now sensors that they can selectively detect ammonia. And also this is used for medical purposes also because ammonia is related sometimes to treatment, certain diseases. And yes, if you can chase the ammonia, this is the way to get an, a, a quantitative grip on the expiration date, if I can use it. And and, and you also mentioned that it, it, it helps that diagnose diseases like diabetes, I guess, or? Well, no, no, this is actually has to do with a kidney disease. Okay. And uh, because during that treatment, there is significant uh, amounts and there are papers and usually this is a key issue to, to monitor. Okay. Um, Alareza is asking if, um, if FSB can be used to simulate suit generation for gasoline, gasoline engine and does it, is it economical? And, I'm guessing Professor Holgi maybe can speak to that. Yeah, I mean, the uh, with FSP, we can make particles from any kind of liquid, let's say. Now, diesel, uh, diesel engines burn liquid fuel. So in this case, we, we used uh, jet fuel, but we could have used also diesel fuel. 
to uh, diesel to generate soot particles? So the answer is yes. The, the question is, um, one needs to play with this tool to find out the parameters uh, that give it um, uh, the, the same particles as uh, those emitted from uh, diesel engines. So you just adjust the parameters and then you can simulate different environments. Exactly. Uh -huh. um, Professor Hojadi is asking, um, how much are you in control uh, of making particles with specific compositions like uh, iron oxide covered with, with silica? Uh, in other words, are you able to just make a few compositions or can you, uh, can you vary the different choices? Absolutely. Yeah, I, th I think that is, again, one of the beauties of FSP that you have a you have a toolbox where you are able to finely tune the composition. So in, in terms of, of magnetic nanoparticles, we are uh, we are also able to add different type of dopants to uh, produce, for example, zinc ferrites or manganese ferrites, cobalt ferrites. Uh, that indeed actually might have uh, um, enhanced magnetic properties depending on which application you want to go for. So I think, uh, I mean, Professor Pratsinis showed us the, the periodic table and that is, I mean, yeah, you can basically select which uh, almost the whole periodic table is accessible um, that you can just add into your precursor solution that you are then spraying and producing your nanoparticles by, by the FSP. And also in, term, in terms of the silica coating, so that was actually my, the focus of my, of my PhD thesis together with Professor uh, Pratsinis and was also then uh, continued in, in theoretically also understanding that process. So we are able to tune, for example, the thickness of the silica coating by, uh, by controlling different process parameters in this reactor. Understand. Thank you. Um, Professor Bertinis, one of the things that struck me when I was at your lab is just how many uh, undergraduate students you have in there and, and just um, the opportunities it opens for your master's and PhD students uh, to develop supervision skills. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about how you involve undergraduate students and maybe some of their contributions to your research. Uh, primarily, I believe so whomever is in engineering, actually, that has passed the first the first year, you can easily help them bring them into the lab. And I have seen that the students and primarily my PhDs are becoming better when they have some students to advise and work with them. Somehow, this is an amazing process. People <laughs> learn better when uh, they try to teach something rather than try to learn it by themselves. And when even my PhDs try to explain to one of these undergraduates what I had advised them to take a look at, then even they, they are becoming much better PhDs. And also the young people, I like them very much to work in the lab. I told them, I don't want you to go to work for the McDonald's or the Starbucks. I mean, I will always find something for you guys. And that way, people that are creative, young, you like them early on to be exposed to the laboratory at the university. And usually most of my PhDs actually came up through that way from, if you like, this uh, early on interaction in the laboratory as assistants helping, you know, a PhD student or a master's student. And usually this works very well. The talented people, they just become more motivated. Everybody, it's a win-win situation. And frankly speaking, if you are a professor and you are responsible for an environment, this is your single most important function to make the environment very attractive. And usually I, what helped me in my career is to think what is best for the student rather than for me personally. Because typically, if these people are happy, also you will be happy. And that's how it works. It's, it's simple, actually. Thank you, Professor. Um, Hi, Bing from, uh, from the audience is asking about uh, soot production during, um, during production of other kind of nanoparticles. So for example, if you're making tin oxide or iron oxide, uh, how much soot is produced at the same time? Uh, Professor Holge, I don't know if you would like to answer that. I think it's better to ask it from Professor Pratsinis or Teleki, oh. because this is involves the unwanted part of uh, soot. <laughs> there, Professor Pratsinis, would you like to address that? Sure. So, I mean, this is a, a standard question because typically in the FSP, we use um, some solutions and people actually, uh, they say, okay, what happens to the soot? And this is, you know, how you should properly control the FSP and always be careful and have this in mind that soot also can be formed in under the FSP conditions. 
So especially if uh, you uh, always you have, as you know, this TGA techniques to actually quantify. And uh, however, we had the facilities here who can make a kilos per hour and they are really practically soot free. Okay, this FSP has the capacity primarily through the dispersion oxygen to take care of that. Okay, I was actually mentioned that also you can do them in conditions that does not involve organic. I had the PhD actually to make uh, soot free or even CO2 free production of particles. And this actually can be done. One of the things I was curious about with the FSB is how much emissions there are in the process, especially if you're talking about mass productions uh, of industries that are billion dollars worth. And I'm wondering if anybody looked at like emission wise. Well, first of all, we have to emit uh, our emissions straight into the city of Zurich, correct? Yeah. So for that, we had actually to be very, very, very strict about this and essentially to uh, monitor. We had actually, so called, if you recall, in our facilities where we had the scale up unit, we had this so called police filter. We had like three filters to go through before you go out. You have to monitor, like every combustion process, even if you make, uh, if you bake bread. People have to honor. I know that because at home, always my parents had difficulty with uh, people cooking, uh, selling bread downstairs. <laughs> yes. But this um, creates excitement. Professor Bujadi has another question for the ethanol methanol sensing system. Is it already in a market? And how much do you think the cost will be of having one? Uh, yes, yeah, actually, this is uh, the first product. And actually, I was talking to people who are making this, who have in this company. Uh, they will actually go first for the distillation units because over there, there is a real problem as you put different type of batches, different type of masses as they call them. And I believe uh, at the end of the summer, they will be the first unit up for sale, primarily for distilleries, because these are the people, first of all, there is a lot of counterfeiting and some of the major distilleries, they call here the association of whiskey. Manufacturers of, of Scotland came here, talked to them, it's very interesting, actually, this uh, business. There, there is a lot of business in that uh, liquor, let's say, sector. And uh, yes, this is going to be the first um, uh, angle that they will try to market these uh, sensors. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Taliki, I had an upsetting conversation a couple uh, a while ago about uh, COVID vaccine. And it was for somebody who is a bit hesitant about taking the vaccines because you have read some conspiracy theory that they include nanoparticles and they automatically assume that's unsafe. And I'm wondering if you can, you, you talked about many different uh, nanomedicine applications that's already being used every day. And I'm wondering if you can speak to the safety protocols involved from, from research labs to um, commercial use. Yeah, I mean, looking at the, at the pharmaceutical industry, I guess the short answer is that any nanomedical product would go through exactly the same drug development chain with all the information needed on, on toxicology, safe use as any other, any other drug product. So it's not really different in that sense. And maybe, maybe we also have to realize that when we are, I mean, when we are developing new drugs, these are also unknown compounds. It's not only nanoparticles that are in the unknown, so to say. So, I mean, there are uh, highly regulated protocols in, in place in the pharmaceutical industry um, before such, such a, a, a new drug for vaccine, for example, can, can reach the markets. I know there has been the, the feeling with the COVID uh, vaccine that there has been some kind of shortcuts taken in order to put it into place. But I think, I mean, th that is not the case. It has followed exactly the same routes as any other a medical product that is put on the market. And I think what we see is actually the, the fruit of a, a lot of many years of, of research and development, for example, when it comes to these uh, lipid-based drug delivery systems. I mean, this was not developed in the past year, but there are actually decades of work behind this um, that we can be very grateful that it was there enabled for us to now rather rapidly put such, uh, such a vaccine product, for example, on, on the market. Um, and then, of course, coming to the yeah more on, on a lab scale, what we are doing in our preclinical research, of course, we are always uh, looking into toxicology, uh, toxic effects of our of our nanomaterials in relevant cell-based models, for example, or also in vivo 
model. So that is always a, a, an essential part of the work. And following, for example, as Professor Pratsinis mentioned, this large Harvard study that has put forward, to, uh, for example, very standardized protocols of how cell toxicity studies should be carried out using such flame-made nanoparticles. Professor. Uh, Professor Holly, I was wondering um, when you talk about suit, I, I want I wonder if you can speak to the urgency of addressing this suit specifically, like how long does it stay in the atmosphere relative to other kind of greenhouse gas emissions and how quickly can we see impact of addressing it? The, uh, so soot is a impacts uh, climate uh, through its warming effect. Uh, this MAC parameter that I explained, is, a, is an important uh, property that describes how it absorbs light. But unlike CO2 emissions, which is also a global warming gas, but stays in the environment for th hundreds or thousands of years, the beauty of its soot is if we stop emitting soot particles now, all soot particles will be deposited in a matter of few weeks. So it's a short lived pollutant. So that's why this is a region where we can make a quick impact and um, that's uh, again highlights the importance of why we need to understand and characterize the warming impact of it. And um, that can help us to make better decisions in terms of in which areas we could make a quick impact in terms of controlling the environment or global warming impact. So uh, to summarize, it's, it's a short lived, uh, you know, pollutant. We can, uh, uh, we can, uh, uh, make a uh, immediate impact by reducing soot emissions. But a problem now is that um, it's not well characterized. Uh, people make um, um, simplifications to when it comes to assess the impact of soot on climate. And those simplifications uh, make the estimates uh, very inaccurate. And that's uh, one of the regions, one of the areas where um, still research is needed to uh, help make better decisions. Yeah, and I think for reference, it's CO2 and methane, they stay in the atmosphere for, for 100 years uh, almost. And, and it, it just, just is, if you stop, it takes 100 years to start actually feeling an impact of it too. Exactly, what we put into the atmosphere will stay there for uh, hundreds of years. But for soot, it's a matter of weeks. So that's why it's so important. I have a question from uh, from Ali Sharani. Uh, he didn't write his question, so I'm assuming he wants to speak. So, you're, Ali, you're unmuted. Hi, how are you? Actually, I have a question for Professor Hovey. I'm wondering, uh, have you ever tried some additional substances to your combustion process, like adding hydrogen to realize uh, the actually the amount of your products like carbon dioxide or nitrogen oxide? This is a new um, uh, initiative, uh, so to speak. So at first we were, I was interested to see whether we can make soot because as Professor Patinis mentioned, um, soot is produced, but usually because, of, because we use oxygen to disperse the liquid, and oxygen oxidizes the, the soot particle. So if you look at FSP flames, they usually don't look um, uh, sooty or, or yellow, which is the, the signature the signature of soot. So uh, with that, we just uh, try to uh, uh, find the parameters with which we can make these uh, particles. But um, again, I, uh, the, uh, the parameters that you can uh, play with uh, are a lot. I remember uh, back in 2016, Professor Pretzinis uh, had a talk in, in Korea and there he mentioned that with FSP, you can make any particles. You win on the red, you win on the, the green. You just need to know what you're doing. Uh, so uh, to answer your question, uh, and also that, that was partly shown in Professor um, Teleki's uh, presentation, we can modify this burner uh, to inject secondary fuels or secondary gases and study their impact on particle formation, but we need to uh, know our target first and then chase that to have a better chance of uh, knowing what we want to do. Recently, uh, I came across an article which um, uh, was published from um, Renewable Energy Laboratory in US where they use AI to scan the process parameter space of FSP 
uh, to find out conditions that can make them particles for a specific uh, battery application. So once we know the application and the goal, then it's possible to modify the burner to make such particles. Thank you, Professor. And it also I, have, I have time for one last question to ask as a general question for everybody. And, and I think what I, what I wanted to ask is uh, if you have ideas for scientists and professors in terms of communicating uh, the research to the public in general in, in terms of science communications and journalism, um, if you can share some of, some of your experience uh, about that. Um, maybe Professor Taliki, do you want to go first? I mean, maybe I can just highlight one of our uh, recent activities. So we have a large science festival here in Uppsala that is given uh, yearly to, uh, to uh, children, basically, uh, in, uh, in primary school up to, up to high school. Uh, so the whole university from all the different disciplines, so natural sciences, medical sciences, and social sciences are offering different type of of activities to these uh, school classes. So it's both for school classes as well as to the public. So parents who want to come, come with their children. And actually this year we converted this whole event that takes place live typically to, a, to an online event, uh, which was unique in the sense that we could send, uh, uh, that we could reach out to schools all over Sweden. Um, so actually in, in terms of, of FSP and, and nanomaterials, we actually prepared a little workshop kit that we were sending to high school students. So we did this together with Professor Soteriu at Karolinska Institutet. Uh, and we, we covered different topics. So they got some uh, magnetic nanocomposite films and magnets that they could try around. We 3D printed uh, agglomerate structures actually. So connecting to the suits that we've been talking about to highlight that nanoparticles are not just small spherical ball-like structures but actually that they have this unique fluffy type uh, structures uh, and then we highlighted some yeah some plasmonic for example nanoparticles and showing their different uh, biomedical applications and we got we got fantastic feedback from these high school students so we actually also had such a, after they had worked with our material we had a Q&A session on, on Zoom where they could then ask questions around the material or nanomaterials in, in general. And I mean, these, these are very, very, I mean, they, they are very curious children and they, and they know a lot uh, already. I mean, you are quite amazed by, by the questions that I asking. They are, um, yeah, they, <laughs> they are well educated. So it was a very, very fun interaction and hopefully then inspire some of them maybe to pursue a, uh, studies further on in, in natural sciences and, and engineering subjects. So, yeah. Thank you. Professor Pratsinas? Actually, this is a very multi-pronged question because we have um, the things like that organized by the university. They mm -hmm. have, for example, days where actually they, the professors, uh, they give presentations to the public and this is organized by the school itself. We also have uh, um, high school presentations, or we individually organized. I had like uh, we had some of these um, uh, what do you call uh, exploratory schools. They have like in Greece. They will come and they visit the labs here, and then when I, I go to Greece, I have to give presentations to that. So it's a little bit, um, I would say, uh, different groups. At ETH, for example, every year in September, they have an industry uh, targeted day. So then they take professors and then they bring, you know, they try to get all the industry because Switzerland has a lot of small industries and they like to expose to them what is new. Mm -hmm. And this is a, an event that, of course, not all the labs, they go simultaneously, but every year they select a different group and they bring it up. So it is a continuous effort to bring it up. And the most important in Switzerland is the institu institutionalization, I would say, for example, if I make a project with industry, the government will pay upfront all the expenses of my students. <laughs> so they really encourage the interaction with the industry. And um, what they call, they, they used to call it this, um, uh, now they call it Inno Swiss, Innovation Switzerland, because they really like to bring as quickly as possible results from ETHs to the practical use in, in the country because people also ask all of this tax money where do they go okay nice you know na nature science 
but how about, you know, for us? So the government here feels quite sensitive to somehow show the value of all of this investment. Thank you, Professor. Mr. Hoggy? Uh, I just want to add that, uh, you know, uh, what, what you're exploring in labs uh, fascinates us and uh, there are many bright people working in labs, but what makes a diff what, you know, differentiates different scientists is not, you know, they, how bright they are or how well they can solve problems. It's how they can communicate those uh, problems to the public. And for me personally, uh, uh, I spent far more time in terms of preparing on, and uh, for different targeted, you know, audience, the results that I have, you know, found than compared to the time that I develop on developing those results. So uh, that's something that is very important. And um, uh, what what me, we sh should do or and what we're trying to do is to uh, study or make innovation in areas that make real impact on the society. And that's very important. And with, with uh, communication or with simple communication, the feedback that we get also can make us come with new ideas and uh, move forward. So that's uh, how uh, it's, it's a mutual interaction, the communication of uh, research finding. Thank you, Professor. I think it's time to go. I think Anna is gonna kick us out. I just wanna say big thank you to everybody. I, it, this would have not been, um, possible without the virtual uh, virtual setting, but I, I, I also uh, I'm very grateful that you've accepted to to come and, and talk to everybody here and, and, and help uh, people learn about the different applications. So I really appreciate it for all of you and all to you. Thank you very much, Carol. And uh, yes, I do hate to boot you out, but we will be closing the webinar. We just wanted to thank you on behalf of Forspace for your wonderful presentations. It was really great to hear from all of you. And I'm really glad that you had a chance to um, uh, engage in a conversation a little bit towards the end and answer some of those great questions. Uh, Carol, you did a wonderful job moderating. Congratulations on pulling all of these folks together, a truly international event, which we very much enjoy. Um, and on that note, uh, I've already put the link in the chat to the recording that's going to be up there shortly. So we'll say goodbye and wish you a good dinner or lunch or breakfast wherever you are and enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Take good care. Thank you. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.